It all happened in 1846 when a young medical doctor by the name of Ignaz Semmelweis was appointed chief medical resident here at the General Hospital of Vienna at the first maternity clinic. Now at that time there were two maternity clinics here, the first and the second clinic. And there was a major difference between the two. The mortality was much higher on the first than on the second clinic. Now at that time we did not know why this was the case, but women were dying of purple fever. Semmelweis tried to figure out what the reason was, and he had an interesting observation. He realized that at the first maternity clinic, it was medical doctors who assisted the women during labor, while at the second clinic, it was midwives. Still, this didn't solve the mystery. But when an incidental finding came along, namely the death of a very dear friend of his, Professor Koreczka, who was a forensic doctor, this solved the mystery. What happened? Well, Professor Koreczka got injured by a scalpel from a medical doctor during autopsy. And then they performed autopsy on him as well. And what they saw was that he had the same findings of women who died of purple fever. And this obviously closed the loop. Semmelweis realized that medical doctors would first go to autopsy, have all sorts of infectious material on their hands, and then they would enter the delivery room and thereby infect the women. Of course, what he then did was he imposed hygienic regulations and rules, especially washing your hands by using disinfectants such as chlorated lime, and that in essence solved the problem. He reported his findings to the medical establishment, but they just simply would not believe him. Because after all, how could a medical doctor be responsible for the death of a patient? Then he got into all sorts of problems with the University of Vienna and he had to leave the hospital. He went to Budapest, he lost his mind, ended up on a psychiatric clinic, and at the end, he died of, believe it or not, sepsis. It took many, many years until Pasteur confirmed his results and now it's common knowledge that hygienics is very, very important. Viruses need a host cell to reproduce. From humans through bacteria and fungi to plants and animals, host cells help the virus multiply. When the virus is left without a host, it continues looking for one during its short lifespan on other surfaces like doorknobs, keyboards or medical equipment. In this phase, the virus is only dangerous if it's intact. Just because the RNA can be detected doesn't mean you can get infected. Regardless of whether or not you touch the surface you know to be contaminated, it's important to remember that 80% of illness-causing germs are spread by your hands, and there are between 2 to 10 million bacteria on your fingertips and elbows alone. Combine that with the virus's fickle nature, and you'll realize your safest bet is to keep your hands and surfaces disinfected. Specifically, COVID-19 survives on plastic for three days and surgical masks for up to seven days. Due to a shortage of masks, this raises the question if we can reuse them. We've got data from our government that we can use masks twice, um, but it's important not to disinfect them by a liquid disinfectant, but with um, steam. So you can use them twice, but they kind of lose protection levels. So FFP3 masks become FFP2 masks, and FFP2 masks stay in the range of FFP2 masks, but on the, on the lower limit. So um, from the data we have right now, um, it's okay to reuse them one time after steam sterilization, but then you have to discard them. So you have to mark the mask and uh, to know which, is, which are the reused ones and which are the fresh ones to discard the re reused ones. In an evaluation of hospitals in Wuhan, China, the CDC concluded that while SARS-CoV-2 is indeed spread through air in which it survives three hours, it was widely distributed through the surfaces in both ICUs and general wards, implying a potentially high infection risk for medical staff. The virus could even be tracked on the floor and medical staff was recommended to disinfect shoe soles before walking out of wards containing COVID-19 patients. Successfully eliminating the virus from your hands and surfaces is a combination of effective products and thorough practice. 
contamination of medical equipment can not only go unnoticed, but it can also have catastrophic consequences. In 2018, there was an outbreak of Myobacterium chimera, which has a rather high mortality and is difficult to diagnose. Experts in Switzerland found out that it was related to contamination of a heat to cooler system, which is part of cardiopulmonary bypass. And a study recently published looked at probes in the ICU and the ED, and they found that despite the fact that these probes were cleaned and disinfected, there were still traces of blood in 50% of cases. Now definitely, you do not want to get in contact with an infected probe or with an infected system. It's a risk to yourself, it's a risk to your colleagues, to the patients, and maybe even to visitors. And definitely, you do not want to take this system through the hospital, maybe even to other patients. But how do we determine which level of disinfection we should choose? Low, medium, or high? Well, that depends pretty much on the so-called germicidal activity. You have to check whether or not your probe or your instrument was in contact with intact skin, maybe with an infected wound, with the mucosa, or with the bloodstream. But in the situation we're in now of the pandemic with COVID-19, you have to have a high suspicion and probably choose a higher level of disinfection. Make sure to begin cleaning immediately after use. Drying and adherence of biological debris may interfere with disinfection later. Keep in mind that even cables and accessories can become sources of contamination, so it's important not to skip their disinfection as well, and to remove any unnecessary objects from the ultrasound machine before getting to the patient. To demonstrate ultrasound probe disinfection, we will use various types of disinfectants, but check back with your vendor which brand of disinfectant can be used. The information can be found on the product's operator manual and on the vendor's webpage. Keyboards may become contaminated, so some scanners might use touchscreen displays, allowing operation of the scanner from a flat panel that is easily disinfected. Prior to cleaning these touchscreen displays, you may want to put the system in cleaning mode if it's available. Then, wipe the screen and its surroundings gently. Be sure to use a systematic approach and wipe the entire system. Leave the display to dry and only then turn the screen back on. Additional levels of safety may include specific covers and foils provided by third parties but make sure they are approved for the specific equipment before use. Keyboard covers should be sterile and single use. Make sure to cover all components which might get in contact with your hands or infectious materials. Proceed to cleaning the transducer. Be sure to remove all visible debris and to clean all parts of the transducer, including the cable and connector. Finally, disinfect the transducer again and finish off by wiping its cable as well. Replace with new wipe if dry. When cleaning the connector, be careful not to damage the pins. If you are working with patients who are infectious, you can protect the transducer with the help of a cover. Place some ultrasound gel into the sleeve. This ultrasound gel does not have to be sterile. Place the transducer in the sleeve and make sure that you do not have any air bubbles.
Then, pull the sleeve to cover the cable. Using a rubber band, which is usually part of the set, seal the tip of the sleeve. Use a second rubber band to seal the sleeve on its distal end. For the gel placed outside of the cover, keep in mind that due to potential contamination, reusable containers present high risk to patients in critical care. Therefore, single-use sachets of sterile ultrasound gel can minimize potential contamination and cross-infection between patients. Special systems are available for quick and easy high-level disinfection. Such systems use a vaporized hydrogen peroxide solution, which has been shown to be highly effective against pathogens. After examining a patient and roughly cleaning the probe, place it in the disinfection system. An indicator, which is placed into the system along with the probe, provides evidence that the disinfection process is complete. Accommodating a wide variety of probes, the system produces results within just a few minutes. So what are our three takeaways? First of all, hygiene is extremely important, especially now in the COVID-19 pandemic. Have a low level of threshold to protect yourself. Protect yourself as much as you can and use all the established methods that we have at hand. And finally, wash your hands, but also don't forget about the surfaces, which are equally important. I do hope that you enjoyed this teaching series. Please leave us a comment, and I do hope that I will see you in the next sequel. We were as diligent as possible in providing accurate facts for this video. As the data on the pandemic keeps updating, we recommend staying informed through reliable and credible sources on a daily basis.